Hello, everyone. Happy New Year. And welcome back to this uh, EGPP seminar series. Uh, for those who join us for the first time, uh, my name is Daniele Caramani, and I will be chairing this session uh, today. And as uh, most of you should know by now, the seminar series combines various types of seminars. And today is a bit of a special session because it's a seminar of the EU Studies Working uh, Group, uh, which is organized by the PhD researchers of the, of the uh, EUI. And we, we are very happy to be able to involve them in uh, the EGPP uh, activities. So today, Amandine Crispy and Lucas Schramm will present their paper titled No More Saints and Sinners, Tracing German Preference Formation in the EU's Response to the COVID-19 Pandemic. Amandine Crispy is an Associate Professor in Political Science at uh, ULB in Brussels, and Lucas Schramm is a PhD researcher at the EUI, and uh, as I understand, a ULB visiting fellow right now. So thank you very much to both Amandine and Lucas for presenting their paper, being with us and taking the time to discuss their research. Due to COVID restrictions, we hold also this session online only. Uh, it's a pity and hopefully this will change soon, but I'm no, I have no doubts that it will be engaging and stimulating non nonetheless. So in terms of format, the speakers will give an initial presentation of about between 30 and 40 minutes and then uh, take questions and comment. To those attending, as always, please, please keep your microphones muted, but the video switched on if possible. And during Q&A, you can use the hand function if you want to make a comment or ask. Thank you all for being with us today, and especially to our speakers, Amandine and Lucas. The floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much, Daniele. We um, decided that I would um, speak first. Uh, I'm very, very happy to have this great uh, opportunity to present our paper. I'm also very happy that I embarked on this little adventure with Lucas um, a few months ago when he arrived as a, as a visiting fellow um, at uh, ULB. Um, so I will just now um, share my screen. We have a PowerPoint, hopefully this will help you to um, follow um, more easily uh, what we're talking about. So this paper is um, investigating EU politics, um, especially in the uh, turbulent uh, spring of 1990, and it deals specifically uh, with German preference formation uh, in the way in which the EU uh, has responded or is still responding to um, the recession caused by the COVID-19 pandemic. So um, I'm sure you're all uh, very uh, well aware um, that a major breakthrough uh, occurred in May, on the 18th of May, more specifically 2020, when the French president Emmanuel Macron and um, the German chancellor Angela Merkel uh, put forward a major historical um, stimulus package. Um, and two features of this package in particular led many observers, starting with uh, the German finance minister Olaf Scholz himself, um, to call this political moment uh, the Hamiltonian moment of the European Union. And those two features are the following. Well, first, the size of the package um, is very, very broad since it almost, not exactly, but almost leads to uh, to double um, the EU's multi-annual financial framework. Um, but most specifically, this money, um, which uh, will be distributed to the member states, um, does not only rely on loans, um, as it has been mainly the case uh, over the last decades, but uh, also on grants, so fresh grant money for about five, um, uh, 500 billion euros. And the second feature of the package is, of course, that this money um, is created, so to speak, uh, is made available through uh, uh, issuing common debt. 
um, hence the Hamiltonian moment, common debt from directly from um, the, the EU's budget and possibly longer term, um, possibly also through the creation of new own resources of the European Union. Now, why is this uh, politically uh, historical? As you know, Germany had long opposed um, to um, such a leap uh, toward joint debt. Um, this notion of a transfer union had become uh, pretty much a, a taboo in German politics uh, or something to absolutely um, avoid. And of course, uh, in the Euro crisis 10 years ago, um, the, the entire German political class, um, together with um, some other European allies, were very uh, much insisting on the individual responsibility of the member states um, in their own economic, socioeconomic situations and on the fact that EU money should flow mainly through loans, uh, meaning through money that would be reimbursed um, later on down the line. Now, what, uh, when, when you look exactly at what happened in this short period of time, you will see that uh, in March and still until uh, early April, um, Germany seemed to align with uh, its northern uh, allies, uh, with the creditor countries um, uh, labeled the frugals, uh, led uh, by um, the Dutch uh, Prime Minister, Mark Rutte, um, who were calling mainly to, uh, to uh, rely on ESM, uh, loans and loans from the European Stability Mechanism only and on minor instruments such as the uh, new shore uh, instrument um, proposed by the European Commission to try and tackle um, this recession. Um, and, and then, um, so this is April, and then in May, you know, on the 18th, uh, as I mentioned in the very, very beginning, you have this French-German uh, press conference announcing this major breakthrough and the very large package. So starting from there, our question is uh, fairly straightforward. It's um, an empirical question, if you want. How can we explain um, this shift uh, within a, a short time frame, a few weeks, uh, from the German government um, to supporting uh, a major impetus for a significant increase in the EU common resources and including the creation of joint debt. So our primary objective with this paper is really to trace German preference formation in this short period of time from early March to, to May, to the public uh, announce uh, of the package in the French-German uh, press conference. This leads us from a theoretical point of view to revisit the debate, which has been quite vivid uh, over the past uh, few years, the, the debate on preference formation in the EU, and perhaps even a little bit more specifically on preference formation in times of crises. So um, we refer here to only a very recent, perhaps the most recent um, contribution um, by Cheshi and Puta, who tap once again into that debate and themselves, um, you know, review uh, this very debate uh, in which uh, many, many colleagues um, that I'm sure you know have contributed to trying to, you know, discuss um, to what extent the various um, theories in European integration uh, are most relevant or less relevant to explain preference formation, to explain um, the outcomes uh, of the crisis the, the, that the EU um, has been facing. So we start revisiting that debate um, by starting perhaps um, by the most common starting point. Uh, as many colleagues, we start with liberal intergovernmentalism because it remains one of the very most established theory, uh, both in IR and EU studies, to, to, explain, um, to explain preference formation. 
And we also follow, um, so of course, um, you know, one of the, when you think about the EU, one of the main analytical device of liberal intergovernmentalism or associated with it is the, this idea of a two level game that you have successively preference formation um, at the national level, and then um, you have international or European um, negotiations and that winning sets uh, you know, are created to allow uh, agreement um, and compromise on uh, outcomes. And here we follow up from, um, you know, earlier uh, work and also a, a number of colleagues have already uh, starting from that point and, and criticize this kind of uh, idea that you would have in the EU successive sequences for preference formation. What a lot of colleagues find, especially if you focus on contempor contemporary EU politics, is rather um, simultaneous um, deliberative processes where um, EU leaders are um, negotiating as preference formation is still happening also in the domestic arenas. Um, so we also, we can talk of a simultaneous double game uh, or also uh, nested games where really those these um, domestic arenas and the EU arena are very much intertwined, um, generating quite complex uh, interactions and patterns of communication and position taking in the public sphere. So we also, um, critically uh, view the fact that um, liberal intergovernmentalism um, or the associated approaches is fairly over rationalistic in some sense. Um, um, it um, assumes uh, stable issue specific uh, domestic preferences, mainly determined by main economic interests. Rather, we see that uh, preference uh, and uh, preference formation um, can or should be envisaged as a construction. It is contingent um, and especially when we talk about times of crisis, you know, something that Jonathan White has been labeling emergency politics, uh, where decisions uh, are made against the background of high uncertainty um, to make those, I mean, even, even though those um, uh, calculations, cost-benefit calculations do uh, and remain uh, rational among actors, they take place against the background of, of uncertainty. And Starting from that critique, we take on board, you know, further theories uh, which have been discussed already quite largely um, in this debate, um, starting with post-functionalists and the way in which they have brought domestic politics uh, into the debate on preference formation. Um, they have quite compellingly argued that contestation uh, in relationship with identity, but also redistribution has come uh, to, um, uh, to form a kind of constraining the census, which very much uh, reduces the ability of national decision makers um, to, to make those deals at the EU level in an autonomous way. They uh, make it, um, publicly constrained by their own constituencies and by um, the way in which EU matters um, are increasingly politicized in the public sphere. So when we talk about the constraining dissensus, we also, um, we, we need to look at both public opinion, um, but also party politics. And here again, uh, we can uh, be uh, perhaps uh, a bit critical uh, in the way in which very often this type of, of view uh, empirically relies on opinion polls and so on, and, and tends also um, to overlook uh, perhaps less rationalistic elements in the way in which um, uh, public opinion, for instance, um, can um, comprehend and um, um, European matters. Thirdly, the third theoretical 
um, uh, approach that we bring in and that we want to discuss uh, is uh, new intergovernmentalism uh, with, um, you know, the uh, importance um, given in this approach uh, and perhaps in contrast with post-functionalism to the autonomy that uh, decision makers and especially uh, heads of states and governments within the European Council still enjoy um, in their seeking of a European consensus. So here, um, again, uh, perhaps our uh, approach, at least empirically, re requires a bit of a different focus in the sense that um, in this primary stage of um, the European debate, uh, it is not um, the European Council, but rather the bilateral French-German talks, uh, which have also involved um, the European Commission, as Lucas will uh, later explain, uh, which are relevant. So to go, to try and go a little bit further, to explain uh, how our um, critical uh, reading of those theories um, leads us and what we're trying to do with this paper. We see theoretical shortcomings um, when trying to um, either contrast or also combine uh, all those theories. Um, we think that all of them uh, actually help or are very useful to explain part of the process of preference formation. So it's not our purpose to focus on one or the other, uh, but uh, to, to try and see how they can be combined, but also where the remaining dark matters lie. And we see a dark matter uh, in, with regard to politicization. When is it constraining, but when can it be also possibly enabling? Uh, how does politicization, like Vivian Spitt put it, at the bottom in the domestic arena, uh, how does it link to or shape or impact uh, politicization at the top among EU uh, leaders? How can we better study those intertwined um, deliberative uh, processes and perhaps overcome uh, over rationalistic accounts of European politics? Perhaps more on, on a side note, but empirically too, um, a lot of that literature because, and it's quite logical, but because it discusses more often than not primarily um, the theories in EU studies, it tends to rely uh, heavily on, um, oh, sorry, the, um, sorry, the discussion of the empirics follows on the next slide. Before that, um, on the right hand side of this slide, I want to explain so how we intend to try and tackle those theoretical shortcomings and to, to try and sharpen uh, our, own, uh, our own perspective. And we wanna do this in two ways. First, we want to put an emphasis on time. Um, I mentioned uh, already um, that in our perspective, the contingency and the inventfulness of politics is a very important dimension um, that should not be overlooked. Um, a, a number of scholars, starting with Peter Hall, but also Colin Hay, um, have already pointed to that fact when analyzing um, the politics of uh, the European and Monetary Union, but also the politics of Brexit. So we need to bear in mind politics remain contingent, remain eventful, and when leaders are making their rational calculations, they can't escape that. And for that reason, um, a very careful attention um, to the exact sequencing of events is important to, to explain how preference formation occurs. So what we find also useful because um, we want to focus on um, that fairly reduced uh, time frame, fairly short time frame where the shift seems to happen, um, I said between March and May 2020, we are really focusing empirically on uh, what Seabrook and Singu call the fast burning um, phase of the um, response 
to the pandemic if you want. So fast burning, meaning when you have this acceleration of events, when decision makers um, perceive that, that um, they need to act, that there is a pressure um, to, make, um, to make decisions. But we don't forget that there is perhaps a deeper slow burning crisis before that. So uh, we're not naively, you know, um, assuming that this shift in German preferences occur within four weeks between March and May. Um, so um, uh, it's important also to bear this in mind. And again, Lucas will, will tell a little bit more about that um, in the next slides. So time is very important. And the way in which we conceive of time, um, both theoretically and empirically. Second um, way in which we want to try and shop in the analysis of preference formation is by bringing perceptions here. In preference formation, um, we argue that the way in which uh, not only decision makers, but also the public at large, perceive uh, a, a given political situation or a crisis, if you want to call it that, um, is extremely important. Uh, what is the problem? What needs to be done? Those are the two basic steps um, in which leaders try to, to tackle a certain situation. And to understand that, you can, of course, um, focus on, on framing and the way um, in which uh, political actors make sense of what is happening and make sense of what they, um, what they need to do. Okay, and I'm now moving on uh, perhaps more quickly also um, from a more empirical point of view, trying to critically uh, address and tap into that, that, that debate. Um, so what we see very often in the, the contributions uh, about preference formation in the EU is a rather stylized account, a broad account of events of uh, what is going on in, uh, in EU politics. Uh, more recently, there have been uh, also contributions relying more on quantitative studies. Uh, a good example is the um, Horizon 2020 project, EMU Choices, which provides uh, a very interesting um, large database comparing uh, position taking, comparing uh, preference formation in all EU member states um, on, the, on the Euro crisis. So we have that. Uh, but even here, um, even the EMU choices uh, database, for instance, um, um, will still rely uh, on quality qualitative case studies as the first stage, let's say, to, to try and, and collect data and then be able to aggregate them um, in a, a larger uh, database. So we find that qualitative case study contextualized uh, in, um, in a reduced uh, number of countries or even single case study remain very, very useful and very important um, to try and unpack um, deliberative processes and, um, and preference formation. So um, it, what is our own strategy uh, to focus on Germany? So we, we um, uh, lie with, uh, with this strategy in terms of a single case study. So we do trace um, deliberations uh, from March to May 2020 through a systematic review uh, of leading German and international newspapers. Uh, we also made, a, let's say, broader um, search to assess the salience of the EU recovery package in the German press. So we used Factiva to do that. Um, of course, we also used a, a wide range of documents which are available, both EU and German. Um, including all the speeches held by the German Chancellor and the Finance Minister in that period of time. Uh, and <clears throat> to complement um, the, let's say, publicly available uh, information um, that we uh, can retrieve from the press or from uh, official documents, we also accessed, um, let's say, more specific information, uh, non-official information through um, a short series <clears throat> of interviews 
with national uh, policymakers and and EU officials. So, of course, um, um, mainly uh, German and French policymakers. And this is where I should stop talking. So I'll stop um, sharing my presentation. So so Lucas can go on with, yes. the, with the findings. Thank you, Amandine. So I will start sharing my screen and hope that I can continue where you where you stopped. Let's see. It is here, yeah. Okay. There we go. So hello also again from, from my side. I'm I'm very happy and excited to, to present our findings, at least our preliminary findings, since we are still about uh, to conduct some of the interviews and kind of trying to, to sharpen our arguments. But what I will do now is kind of present the findings so far along the, the lines of the three uh, theories that uh, Amandine has introduced and that we are speaking to and trying to refine. In general, I should say we indeed find that many of the different factors and dynamics, actors that are stressed by the different theories indeed occurred simultaneously at different levels of government in the time period that we are looking at um, rather than successively. At the beginning, so if we go back to, to March, we find that um, all governments basically, but the German government maybe in particular, was very much concerned with the national implications uh, of the pandemic. For example, there was this televised speech by Chancellor Merkel in, in mid-March, where she did not even mention um, the term Europe a single time. So this was about the uh, um, lockdown in Germany, the, the restrictions on individual and economic uh, activities, but there seemed to be no European um, dimension. This, by the way, was quite different um, by a televised speech, maybe at the same day or, or the day after by the French president Macron, who already had this European um, dimension. But for Germany, at least um, at this point in mid-March, uh, the European dimensions of the, of the pandemic and the implications of the pandemic did not play a role. And a bit later, the German finance minister Scholz even turned down discussions on possible uh, ESM loans as premature and inappropriate. So at this point, we are still talking about mid uh, to late March. Some observers already saw a return of this kind of toxic um, um, and simplistic debate between uh, northern creditor countries and southern debtor countries that we witnessed in the financial end subsequent Eurozone crisis a, de a decade ago. But then, of course, things evolved quite differently. And in the paper, we uh, try to show how the dimension of time and the dimension of perception mattered for this change. So to start with, and speaking kind of to liberal intergovernmentalism, so focusing on domestic interest and uh, economic actors in particular, we find that economic actors rather aligned with than shaped governmental positions. So there's little evidence overall for this se sequential model that is suggested by liberal intergovernmentalism. Looking at the, at the documents, um, the communications by the main German interest groups in March and April, there are basically no calls for a bold European response. Everything is still focused on the national level, even the, the sub-national um, kind of regional level is, is their main concern. So also for economic actors, it took time to assess the individual uh, situation and the way they were affected by, by the pandemic. And then in April, little by little, their main concern became that um, the stability of the single market, uh, the stability of the Eurozone um, might be at stake. And one of our interviews here stressed that only in the course of the crisis did, for example, the German car industry, which very much is, of course, export-led, realized how dependent it was on supplier firms from uh, northern Italy, which at that point suffered from the heavy lockdown. 
Then perhaps particularly interesting, the BDE, so the main German business association in mid-May, issued a much cited joint paper with its French and Italian counterparts in which they called for large European stimulus programs that would also involve grants. But again, here we are already at mid-May, so this happened roughly at the same time that Merkel and Macron were about to present their joint proposal on a, Euro on a European recovery fund. So this happened, this, this um, first and major BDE call for, uh, European, for large European response um, happened when German and French actions were already way well underway or e even, even close to be completed. Let me now turn to kind of the second theory that we address, post-functionalism. So regarding domestic politics, we find that the German government had comparatively large room for maneuver for its EU-level actions. Other than post-functionalism might expect a domestic constraining dissensus eventually did not materialize. And in the paper, we argue that this was mainly due to efficient framing on the part of the German government and the very particular nature of this crisis. Again, looking at the, at the documents, at the different speeches given by the chancellor, the finance ministry, we find that perhaps like never before, Merkel, Scholz and other German policymakers called upon, and now I quote, European solidarity. So this terms, these two words, European solidarity, again and again appear in the public speeches, but only from uh, mid-April onwards. Again, a uh, short comparison. So in March, at various occasions, Merkel still spoke of the corona pandemic as the biggest challenge in German history, the biggest challenge for Germany since the end of the Second World War. And then from April, this turned into the notion of the corona pandemic as the EU's biggest ever crisis. And here perception and also empathy mattered since German policymakers were stressing that the corona pandemic was an exogenous crisis that in fact was nobody's fault and affected every member states. So symmetric shock that required, uh, that required unique measures. And with this kind of framing and the call for European solidarity, it met, it met much um, or broad party political and public su uh, support, or we could say at least indifferent for its EU level action. So there was again, as I said, this, this large room for maneuver and notions, for example, of moral hazard or free riding when it, when it, when it came to um, European fiscal risk and burden sharing as we had witnessed 10 years ago during the Eurozone crisis, in this case, did not materialize. Our interview is also stressed that, of course, it's mattered that this time the composition of the coalition government was, was quite different. So there were the Social Democrats no, next to the Conservatives compared to 10 years ago when there were the Free, Demo, Free Democrats. And a couple of interviews also stressed that, of course, it mattered that Wolfgang Schäuble this time was not uh, the finance minister. So especially we saw that the social democrats were, were pushing this notion of European uh, solidarity with the German minister for European affairs, uh, Michel Roth, even subscribing to the idea of, of Corona bonds. So again, this was a completely different kind of discourse and notions than, than witnessed uh, 10 years ago. But strikingly, it, it did not met much opposition either from the from the broader, broader public, so popularity for the chancellor, popularity for the um, German conservatives remained uh, high, and there was also no backlash from her party. So we also checked the communication from the parliamentary group of the um, of the CDU CSU, and they subscribed as well to the to the Franco-German plan. And lastly, um, kind of speaking to new intergovernmentalism and the actual creation of the recovery fund, here we, we clearly find that the role of uh, France and Germany on the one hand, but also the role of the European Commission were crucial. 
So as is stressed by new intergovernmentalism, elite bargaining, the search for consensus, compromise searching mattered. Um, clearly, this was the creation of the European Recovery Fund very much was an, um, an endeavor and a, a plan that was um, developed and negotiated at the highest political level. But we want to stress that the role of the two largest countries actually mattered in particular. And here, of course, it's, it's again crucial to recall that when the corona pandemic hit Europe in early March, and when it came to possible European response to the crisis, Germany and France found themselves at different, one could even say opposite positions. So Germany, on the one hand, very reluctant when it came to European economic response, eventually um, favoring ESM loans. And on the other hand, France joining a camp of eight other countries and their call for Corona bonds. But then kind of starting to realize that a common European response, a broader European compromise would only be possible if there was prior Franco-German agreement, the two governments intensified their bilateral contact. And this was also stressed by a couple of interviews. This happened at different levels. This happened between the two finance ministries. This happened between the Elysee and the Chancellery. And this happened at, so basically both at political and civil servant level. And importantly also, as we are trying to, to, to stress, events happened at the same time. So this intensifying Franco-German bilateral work on the eventual recovery fund happened in parallel to the broader negotiations at the EU level. So for example, when much of the media and the observers were focusing on this first Eurogroup package that was agreed, uh, I think, on the 9th of April, now with hindsight, Franco-German interviews, they, they, they said that it was clear at this point that that was not be the end of the stories, that there was something much bigger uh, to come. On the other hand, I think it's also important to stress the role of the, of the European Commission, maybe against this more intergovernmentalist theories. So the Commission from early on had promoted the idea of linking a um, Corona recovery instrument, as it called it, with the next multi-annual financial framework. And here maybe it was a, a lucky historical coincidence that negotiations on the next long-term EU budget had failed in February. So, and at the same time, there had to be an agreement before the end of 2020. So it was clear that the commission had to come up with a renewed proposal anyways. And now it saw, it saw the chance of combining this renewed proposal with a linkage to the Corona recovery uh, instrument. And both interviews from the commission, as well as from the German side and the French side, they told us that there were intensified uh, contacts, again, at the civil servant level between France, Germany, and the commission, but also at the highest political level with, uh, I think one French interview is said that at one point there were two calls at least per week uh, between Merkel, uh, Macron, but also von der Leyen, the European Commission president. And talk about sequence, it's, I think it's also quite interesting to see that eventually um, the Franco-German initiative from 18th of May came nine days before the kind of official commission uh, proposal. So the Franco-German initiative that was confirmed again by, by the interviews gave uh, much political spin and weight to, uh, to the upcoming commission proposal. Now, very briefly, for the sake of time, some, some conclusions and maybe an outlook. So in the paper, we, we make the argument that um, different theories point at important factors and dynamics, but no uh, theory alone can explain the supposedly sudden and dramatic shift in German preferences and the coming about of the EU recovery fund. We look at both material and ideational factors and we stress the importance and interlinkage between dynamics at the national and at the EU level. And as Amandine was, was explaining, we, we find elements of uh, fast burning and slow burning crisis. So of course, within the short period of time between early um, March and mid May, a lot of things happened that were 
um, not, not imaginable basically before. So the crisis itself clearly had an, had an impact, um, creating this window of opportunity for a huge step, a potential huge, huge step in European integration. But at the same time, this all happened within broader uh, discussions about European fiscal policy, um, Franco-German um, negotiations and dip, uh, lip, um, deliberations on um, deepening of, uh, of the Eurozone, so there, there were there were much dynamics that uh, different actors could uh, could build on. Mm, we highlight the importance of uh, three factors uh, again coming from the three different theories. And when it comes to longer term shift or not in in German uh, EU fiscal preferences. Mm, what the Germans say so far that uh, the recovery fund clearly is a one-time instrument for a unique crisis and a unique challenge. But um, of course, there are already discussions whether to kind of transform this into a, a permanent longer term instrument. There are calls from the French side. There are also calls from the commission side. There are calls from the uh, European Cent Central Bank. And in our understanding, what, what we, what we kind of learned and, and found out with, with the interviews and with our assessment of the um, of the different primary documents, very much um, with regards to the to the German take uh, and, and, and preference for EU fiscal uh, policies will indeed depend on how this recovery fund now is is implemented. So whether there will be a a swift Im Im uh, implementation and really targeted future oriented spending. So how this kind of um, exercise um, will play out uh, in real now. And I guess I will stop here. Thank you, Amandine, and thank you, Lucas, for this interesting overview on your paper, going through the theory and the results. We can open the floor now for comments and uh, questions. You can use the function on the, the hand function, or if you prefer to write in the chat, um, I'll look at both. Um, we can start with Paul. Uh, thank you very much, Daniele, and, and thanks a lot to Lucas and uh, Amandine uh, for the very interesting paper. Um, my question um, relates to the, the, the emphasis that you want to put on uh, this idea of sequencing. And, and in this regard, um, I was a bit surprised that you did not refer to an element which, in my view, is, is of some importance, which <clears throat> is um, the decision of the German Constitutional Court of uh, the 5th of May uh, on the PSPP, so quantitative easing, so 13 days before at the joint uh, Franco-German position. The German Constitutional Court uh, for the first time ever um, um, suggested that the ECB might have gone beyond its powers and so that potentially the limits of monetary policy might have been um, reached. And so, I mean, some commentators, uh, including myself, uh, we've argued that this might have prompted the German government to go further um, on the economic side since basically um, the margin of maneuver on the monetary side had been uh, exhausted. So I was just I was just wondering what your views were on on that very specific element and the importance it might have played, especially on on, on German uh, preference formation. Thanks a lot. Shall I address it directly, Daniela? Yes, yes, please. Mm, because I think it's it's a very important point, and I was sure it is. It was. Uh, coming up and of course I asked the question again and again uh, in the interviews with the with the German uh, civil servants and, and policymakers and of course we can doubt this argument but at least that's what comes up again and again is that they are saying this was a timely coincident it just happened at the same time but uh, discussions were already underway so for example this Franco-German proposal came what was it 10, 11 days later, and may maybe there was some 
political spin, some additional political spin. But what they say that these discussions were already way un, uh, well underway. Um, and um, since the, this Constitution Court ruling more refers to, I mean, more to the, to the ECB and kind of monetary policy, the, the Germans, at least in the interviews, they were quite clear that at this point when the court ruling came, they were already sure that something had to be done on the fiscal side. So I wouldn't say that there was any causal relation in the way that there was a, um, the court ruling and then something big happened on the German side. Um, of course, I would be careful to, to say that we can exclude. Probably there was some implicit impact but again, I asked again and again, they, they were saying this was this was a coincidence and it, it was a different topic and something was in the making anyways from our side. Thank you, uh, Lucas. Um, next, I have uh, Robin on the list. Yeah, <clears throat> thanks a lot for sharing your paper. I, I, I really enjoyed re reading it. And um, I actually have three questions, um, uh, starting with one which is linked to the title. I really liked the title. And I must say that I had uh, quite another set of expectations while, while reading it uh, uh, from, from what I was, uh, from, from what I read. And, and I'm, I'm going to go through it. Um, but basically, I think you, what you what is striking, what the, the kind of puzzle that I really buy is we want to compare the 2011 story and the 2020 story. So basically, the German position has shifted. And my my first main question on the paper is or on the draft paper is now you know what makes it more than a German story. Uh, and I think this is really something that would be helpful to 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 kind of also also look into because I see the in the literature you're, you're presenting you're going through the different EU integration stories which are indeed you know potentially one way to look at it but you could also have taken it I mean have approached it from a purely let's say institutionalist perspective looking at the, the German preference formation uh, development within a pure uh, German domestic environment. So, you, you know, is it just this time is different would have been the first question on the German side, maybe context uh, yeah, matters. Second, is the politics different uh, on the German side as well, just because there is you, you're, you're mentioning it in the paper as well, but is it something, you know, another second kind of necessary condition. And then perhaps a third question, which is linked to it, and I think that would have been my main intuition. Um, looking at it would be is there a cognitive shift that has happened and and if so that's that's my second question where is it coming from where is this cognitive shift coming from and what I really kind of perhaps the thing I, I, I maybe the point I buy a bit the less even though that's coming uh, strongly from the paper in your interviews in that everything happened at the same time in a way that's the, basically the bit that is a bit as a reader a bit unsatisfactory we want to know a bit more where it's coming from. Is it coming from, I mean, typically, you know, is it coming from, from uh, Merkel herself? Is it coming from a public opinion that has changed? Is it coming from the finance ministry that has also had also a different cognitive shift? Is it coming from France? Uh, also all these things. So, so basically reconstructing, perhaps if you have a final bits of uh, interviews in, in the coming weeks, that could be something really uh, trying to retrace exactly uh, where, where it may be coming from. I, I can imagine it's it's certainly not an, an, an as easy task as it sounds, but it would be something that, as a reader, again, I would be most excited in learning about. Um, third point, and and it's something that I find also the most striking or interesting argument that you're uh, hinting at, and perhaps would be worth developing is that if you seem to suggest this may be lead, coming from the top, so from really Merkel leadership also having kind of pushed a bit that change in the German public opinion. Um, I like, we, I really liked the argument of, you know, perhaps she managed the, the health crisis well, so that gave her more leeway at the, at the EU level to kind of conduct that major shift in terms of a German position with regard to EU fiscal integration. So perhaps that's something also that, that would be worth uh, developing more. Maybe you're doing it in, uh, already, but uh, that's, yeah, that, that'd be my personal take on it. Thanks a lot again. Okay. Lucas, do you, 
I can perhaps make some remarks and you can follow up. Okay, let's do it this way. Thank you. Um, these are all very interesting points. Uh, and I think we have a number of elements in, in the paper to address those points. Um, it is more than a German story, uh, of course. Um, and perhaps a methodological preliminary uh, remark for me is that we are not seeking to do a term by term comparison between 2010 and 2020. Um, this question was uh, raised already. We presented a first draft of the paper in uh, Louvain La Neuve, and the colleagues there also made this point and they said, Oh, you should do that. And we don't want to do that because um, it's a completely different paper and uh, there are a lot more factors that you would need to take into consideration. So of course, um, some empirical elements would point to what is different this time. And that's precise the argument that we make and that we refer to uh, in the title saying, well, the framing and the perception of the problems and the solutions are radically different. But um, the paper is not constructed as a terms by terms comparison between the outcome of the 2010 um, talks and uh, the outcome of the 2020 uh, talks. Um, so beyond preference formation uh, in Germany uh, itself, and why is this larger than just a German story? So there's the whole EU uh, politics dimension which we analyze. And a, a very important uh, fact here is the uh, common letter that nine member states um, sent to the president of the European Council on the 9th of April, um, including France, uh, but also not only a very small club of southerners, including also Belgium, including Slovenia, including a number of member states calling for Corona bonds. And that accelerated tremendously um, the politicization um, in, in a more confrontational way. And in the following meeting of the Eurogroup and of the European Council, uh, we saw a more politicized confrontational um, turn taken by, taken by the discussions. And this put the pressure, this really, um, um, put the pressure on the main players to do something beyond the initial package relying on EMS, ESM loans and shore, which was agreed by the Eurogroup. And that's where France and Germany decide to, to, uh, to really accelerate um, the, bi the bilateral contacts. Now, turning to the second remark about the cognitive shift, this is a very, very interesting point, and I honestly think that an entire paper could be well written only about this. Um, and we do use this distinction between the fast burning sequence and the slow burning sequence precisely to not give the impression, as you said, Robin, that uh, everything is suddenly happening at the same time, you know, and the window miraculously opens and everything changes. Uh, it's not like that. So a very important finding that we uh, that comes out from the interviews and that we do emphasize in the paper is that the recovery fund follows from all the work and all the um, talks between France and Germany since at least Meseberg, if not before, if not 2015, and since the adoption of this undersized uh, budgetary instrument for competitiveness um, and what's the name again, and convergence in the Euro area. So this BICC, which was adopted uh, if I'm not mistaken, in December 2018 by the Eurogroup. Um, both um, the French officials, but also Commission officials um, said we a lot of work had already been done into how to come forward on the front of uh, fiscal policy, on the front of common resources, and in a way, the recovery plan is not that much different from that. So there is a logic in terms of policy instruments um, that they saw 
so not everything was in invented, um, you know, on the spot from scratch in March uh, or April or May uh, 2020, very far from that. So that's where you really need to combine those two um, time dimensions to understand how the plan comes about. Um, thirdly, uh, we did find that um, decisions were pretty much top down. So although, of course, there were a lot of pre-existing work between the finance ministries, they were not informed until a very late stage. So really, the bulk of the work was made at the level of heads of states and government and the cabinet of von der Leyen. Within the commission, they set up a small group of 10 people who were working under strict confidentiality about that and who were not allowed to go public about what they were, um, what they were preparing. Um, so, um, so yeah, that's about it. The very last word coming back to the first, um, uh, the first remark uh, from Paul on the Constitutional Court. Um, some interviewees indeed pointed to um, the enabling effect, let's say, of the court judgment, but also one interviewee, and actually um, perhaps even several of them, uh, on the contrary, said that the last thing uh, which was um, um, that, that Merkel had to think about early May was the legal feasibility of joint borrowing and joint debt. And they had to fix the details about that, notably because she would have feared some broader contestation, potentially coming from Karlsruhe about the legal, um, let's say, um, legal soundness of this new of this new thing. Maybe very shortly. I, I mean, I can only agree and subscribe to what Amandine was already saying. Maybe to the to the cognitive shift. Maybe th th there was one. So sometimes in the interviews, it, it occurred that people were saying, of course, we learned lessons from the management of the financial crisis. Of course, there were mistakes being done back at the time. Of course, it took too long to make decisions, to make both decisions back then. But I think the most important point, what was coming up again and again, and you can see that the official speech is given by the chancellor, by the finance ministry um, and other policymakers. It's about the kind of unique and distinct nature of this crisis, that it was exogenous, affecting everybody, and it was nobody's fault. That was coming up again and again. And as the recovery fund is um, designed, and as it was promoted by Germany, it's really as a, as a one-time instrument to tackle a hopefully unique crisis. So I'm, I'm, I'm not sure with this cognitive shift. Maybe there are some elements, but, but, but I think it's, it's more this, th th this is a maybe once in a life crisis, a unique crisis or a unique nature. And we need, we need unique distinct instruments to, to tackle this. Okay, thank you. I have uh, three people on the list now, uh, Bruno, Adrienne, and then uh, Philip. Uh, Bruno, please. Thank you, and uh, congratulations for the for the presentation. Um, my my question is and and comment relates to what has just been said, namely this idea of continuity and change. So, my my comment is about the nature of the recovery plan. Um, there's one big change compared to the uh, BICC and other plans that came before. And that is the fact that with the recovery plan, there is no joint liability for the member states. It's the European Union that is borrowing for, um, for spending. And that, of course, solved the problem that Amandine just mentioned that Merkel had. You know, the problem of Merkel that she had to, you know, to be able to explain why the German taxpayer would have to pay again for these other countries and also the possibility that the German Constitutional Court might create problems there. So with the solution found with the recovery plan, there is no joint liability. So Germany doesn't pay anything here. The European Union borrows, and who knows when it's going to be paid back. You know, it's in, in the distant future. So that's a major change, I think, in, in the way the plan was, was articulated. And I was wondering who got the idea. 
because the idea was not straightforward in the sense that traditionally it was always considered that the European Union could not borrow for spending. This was like a sort of unwritten or maybe written rule in the treaty. Anyway, this was like taboo. And now suddenly it is accepted that the EU can borrow for spending. So what I would be reading is who got that idea? Who got this, this sort of breakthrough idea? Does it come from the commission or does it come from France or Germany? And I wonder whether you found out something uh, about this. Thanks. I mean, shall, shall I go first? Maybe, maybe you add something then. I think it, it was the commission. It was the commission, at least what is what is publicly available and the information that we have, that this, this idea of linking the recovery instrument with the regular long-term EU, EU budget. This was promoted and as far as we see it, we, we learned in our research, this was developed within, within the commission. Um, and then you, you're absolutely right that Germany only subscribed to a financial package with several liabilities, so no joint liability. And here it's again interesting to see how French and German positions came closer over time. So for example, this Le Maire plan by early April foresaw a standalone fund outside the EU budget, basically Corona bonds by design. It, he didn't term it Corona bonds, but the implications, the legal implications would have been Corona bonds. And the Germans were quite clear that this is not happening. It's not happening from a legal point of view because the treaties would have to be changed and it's not happening from a political uh, point of view. Um, some people are saying that this would have been political suicide in, in Germany. I mean, this was really a red line and still in this extraordinary crisis, this red, red line has not been crossed. So German kind of condition has always been this recovery fund has to be financed and paid out via or within the frame of the EU, of the EU budget and not as a standalone fund. Can I just add two words to that? Um, basically, what the, uh, of the record, the Director General of ECFIN explains is that the biggest fear of the Commission is that once again, a, a major policy instrument in the form of a fund would be created outside of the EU legal framework, as it was the case 10 years ago. And they didn't want that at all, of course. And that's what perhaps the French actually put forward in the beginning. So the Elysee you know, thought, well, if the commission takes 10 years to come up with something feasible, then we'll just go you know, with an intergovernmental instrument. Um, and the commission didn't want that. So they all followed their reasoning, basically this group of 10 people I was uh, mentioning uh, earlier, they, you know, following from the idea, um, the MFF negotiations have broken down. We need to show why we need an EU budget. Politically, it is important. We need to relaunch the MFF. So we need to link the recovery fund to the MFF. And the, the, the final step was, how can we borrow more money to do that? So, uh, Adrienne, you're next. Uh, thanks a lot for the very interesting paper. I have actually a methodological question. So your explanandum is the change of German preferences. And you have then a number of theories which you say, rightly so, they have a possibility for explaining this change of preferences. But then you do not go on and formulate hypothesis ex ante, but you kind of read from your empirical material then of results in the end, what the important theoretical contributions are. Now, of, that's a kind of joint causation if you talk in this language, but of course you can't say because you have in a way an overdetermination of your uh, outcome, that is the change of German preferences, you have one case and three explanations if you want to. And you can't say well, how much each one contributes to this particular change in preferences. So you didn't want to do that. I just, uh, it would be interesting to hear 
what your position is on that, your methodological position. Amandine, I would be happy if, if you took the question. Okay, yeah, sure. Um, yes, it is a kind of peculiar exercise. So it's not that straightforward. Uh, we, we think that this theory is relevant. We have hypotheses and we apply the hypothesis. So you described uh, well what we're trying to, to do, uh, but, and um, perhaps the presentation um, does not uh, express this efficiently, but um, what we should uh, more emphasize more in the paper is I think we can make conclusions about which theory explains more. Um, so regarding um, liberal intergovernmentalism, we say basically in that case, it's not very satisfactory in the sense that economic interest did not play a role in shaping government preferences. It happened simultaneously. So this one at least is not, um, you know, explaining a lot uh, of our puzzle. Um, then uh, going to post-functionalism, what we say is um, it's not that, you know, the party politics and public opinion are not explained as uh, the post-functionalists have proposed it at least um, uh, in the in the literature in a constraining way it because it was more enabling actually or at least let's say neutral perhaps more neutral would be it was not constraining let's say in the sense so what we write is the constraining dissensus does not materialize and i think that's really the be the best way to put it um which doesn't mean of course that from an explanatory point of view, party politics and public opinion are not important, but we said they do not uh, constrain the leaders because decision-making does happen top down because public opinion is not well articulated. We have data from opinion polls um, showing that, um, you know, before uh, actually, before the end of April, there is no salience of the EU recovery package in the German public sphere. And uh, we have a finance minister who, and that's quite interesting, took the credit for what happened, you know, afterwards in the press said, oh, I was always pushing for that. But at the moment, he was very, very cautious. He was not doing that much. We find no evidence that he was at the forefront of the battle, neither in Germany nor in EU politics. So it re really decision making happened from the chancellery. And of course, Scholz, once the mis decisions were made, was very happy to say, we'll support this enthusiastically, of course. Um, so, um, you know, Post-functionalism is not irrelevant, but in that particular case, it doesn't play out in the form of a constraining uh, consensus. So what we find perhaps most um, compelling uh, here is really uh, the, this deliberative consensus seeking that neo, uh, that new intergovernmentalists um, put forward, but also with the qualification that we say uh, you know, new intergovernmentalism tends to say that uh, supranational institutions uh, are not the key players and that um, they tend to take the role as agencies uh, just executing or enforcing um, the broader political directions decided by the Eurogroup. And in this particular instance, we find that it's not the case. We find that um, Yes, the European Commission did wait to announce its own plan because it needed badly the political weight of France and Germany behind it. But without the Commission, the French and the Germans most probably would not have found the, the right legal and institutional form of the package which made the agreement possible. So we find a kind of strong interdependence between the two, between the expertise of the commission who says we can find a viable instrument via the community framework and um, the political, let's say, will uh, of France and Germany to go ahead with a major political step. 
Thank you, Amandine. Uh, Adrienne, did you want to um, add something? You should unmute yourself. Sorry, but I have to, I have to leave, sorry. Lucas, um, did you want to add something to this point? Yeah, maybe very, very briefly. Short, so we... Very briefly, um, maybe also I learned because as you, Adrian, but, but also Philip, you, you know that I had a quite early early paper where I was trying to make sense of this only from a liberal intergovernmentalist perspective, and there were there were clear limitations, and it, it, it didn't work out. So it became clear that um, more theoretical perspectives were were needed. Uh, um, the emphasis on on different factors, uh, the emphasis on different di dynamics. So I think as, as far as I see it, it's not about confirming or disconfirming um, specific theories, but really trying to look to look at this complex negotiations, these complex case studies from different theoretical angles um, and see what is there and, 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 and what is not there. And I think Philip with, with Marcus, they, they went further and saying why this uh, was not a uh, post-functionalist moment. We haven't done this, but this was not our, our purpose. It's just to say that there are, there seem to be certain conditions and also political framing um, with an emphasis on European solidarity when there's a particular kind of crisis where this post-functionalist moment doesn't seem to be there. So this is a good point to um, go to Philip. Uh, yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, first for this uh, very interesting talk. I, I have a very brief comment on who invented the link between the recovery fund and, and the budget. And I think Luca said it was the commission, but in my recollection, the idea uh, came up in the parliament. The parliament, there was a debate or something already in late March, and there it was criticized that uh, no link was made between the crisis and the budget. And this, if I remember correctly, was then very quickly taken up by, 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 by the commission. Um, now my, my question uh, picks up from Adrienne's question about um, causal identification. Now, Luca said, this is not about confirming or, or disconfirming, but you, know, you don't want to use these theories just as descriptive lenses, right? T to make this more specific, Robin asked, um, uh, uh, where did this cognitive shift uh, in Germany come from? And then Lucas said, well, this is a once in a lifetime crisis. It's symmetric. Uh, it's nobody's fault. So it's exogenous. It's symmetric. And, um, you know, lessons from the Eurozone crisis were learned. Um, business groups were aligned. Um, Okay, all fine. But then why didn't the same arguments also lead to a cognitive shift in the Netherlands, for instance? Um, you know, implicitly, um, there's, there's this comparison to the frugal force that you don't make explicit. You have some um, states like Ireland who signed up to this uh, uh, corona bond idea, or Belgium for that matter, um, uh, whom you would have expected in, in the northern camp um, um, uh, uh, from the Eurozone experience. So the, the North shrank from the Eurozone crisis to um, um, uh, the COVID crisis, but there are some holdouts. And why do you still these, uh, see these holdouts even though Germany has learned? Okay, thank you. Um, who would like to tackle this? Maybe I go first um, on, on the Netherlands. Um, 
Maybe there wasn't a shift as distinct as in the German case, but I think it's still remarkable that in July they subscribed to a huge recovery fund and 390 billions in grants. I mean, what the, the Dutch stressed that they managed to kind of water it down and they, they changed this mix of grants and loans. And yes, there are more now than grants as the Commission and also France and Germany. Um, wanted in the first place, but I think the real thing that needs an explanation is why they subscribed at all to this recovery package, including, including grants. Um, so again, maybe there wasn't a shift as distinct as in the German, I mean, what, what also came up in the interviews that Germany with the upcoming council presidency, the largest member states, um, all the eyes on, on the German government, they were in a particular situation and they came, that's, that's, that's what they said internally, they came to a co conclusion that now with France in this camp of uh, Corona bonds countries in Germany, supposedly again in the Northern camp, th th this was kind of a precondition to, to come to a Franco-German compromise first in order then to, to broker and enable a broader uh, European compromise. So this maybe indeed was, was different in the German case compared to the Netherlands or, or the Austrians that still could could stick to more frugal conditions, if you want. Whereas German policymakers felt this kind of responsibility to move more into a mediating position. But again, when it comes to the Netherlands, I, I see at least a, a small uh, shift um, when you compare their discourses in, in March and April to what they signed up to in, in July. It's also a remarkable shift. I'd like to add, um, it's very stimulating, I think, that you're pushing us with your remarks to uh, go further. And as you said, Philip, not just, you know, in a descriptive way, uh, take the theories and say, oh, they need to be qualified in that and that sense. What we could easily do with the paper as it is now and with what we have is make, is formulate to more uh, explicit hypotheses, which are perhaps only implicit now, and which we make about time and perceptions. And those two hypotheses would be, well, one about time and this double fast burning and slow burning of the crisis explaining the cognitive shift. And then um, the second hypothesis about the importance of the perception of the nature of the crisis and of the framing of the crisis in the um, time frame that we examine in the fast burning phase of the crisis. I think perhaps it would make uh, the paper more compelling in saying, okay, we're not just trying to um, evaluate, let's say on the basis of our empirics um, and um, you know, um, say what is working and what is not, but that we're also putting forward our own, our own hypothesis. Would that make the paper more compelling? Well, I, I, if I can jump in as well, I think you would have uh, various possibilities to um, further develop your argument. I mean, obviously in different papers because this one is already uh, different, uh, very, very full, but there would be possibilities to expand the, the analysis in very interesting ways. And that's why I, I think it's very intriguing, intriguing what you're trying uh, to do. Um, and I was thinking in particular, something you have in the, in the conclusion, this interplay between the moral hazard and no one's fault. Uh, so the exogenous factor plus the symmetric uh, or uh, asymmetric nature of a, of a crisis. But rather than go towards a comparison between countries, I thought that maybe possibility would also be to uh, have a comparison um, between cr crisis and uh, whether you would come to the same conclusions if, for example, you would have a crisis or compare, I mean, this, this health crisis is obviously exogenous and it is symmetric. What if you compare it with a crisis uh, like the refugee crisis, which is uh, uh, also exogenous, but uh, not symmetric as it affects certain countries more than others or the 
financial one, which is not exogenous and not uh, symmetric. I mean, I, I think if you if you if you play a bit around with uh, this, I mean, in the end, prob possibly it's a two by two uh, table where you can classify these countries. Whether your theories hold uh, when you start comparing these these crises, and obviously then it would become too complex also to add the, the cross-country com comparison, but you would have configurations, um, because I don't like the remark, it's a one, once in a lifetime uh, crisis, because uh, from a comparative perspective, nothing is once in a lifetime. There is always something you can compare uh, an event, uh, an event uh, with. So maybe this is a possibility for further research uh, in other papers. This sounds more like a, a doctoral dissertation than a paper, but uh, yes, it's a good idea to, compa to compare it like a, in a big book. Mm -hmm. Maybe just a very quick um, re reply to, to Daniela. Um, what immediately came to my mind, what, what is the different, for example, compared to the migration crisis? Mm -hmm. Why is, sorry, I don't know why I'm disappearing. Anyways, it's it's the effectiveness. So in the in the pandemic, in in the case of the Corona crisis, every member state was affected, maybe to different degrees, but they were all affected. As for example, the German business representatives in the interview said, when Italy went into lockdown and with all the border closures, etc., also the export industry felt felt the impact. Mm -hmm. Um, and in the case of migration, um, I mean, there are also various papers on that. It was maybe a majority or less than or less than half of the members is really affected by, by this inflow. So I think the, the effectiveness, this, this would be my first reaction. Yes, I, I, I do think that you have crisis or events that deterritorialize, and this would be one of them whereas other crises would territorialize the, the confrontation so between countries, rather, uh, which is not the case in this, uh, in this uh, crisis, from what, I mean, from what I make out of your conclusions. But I think we, I don't see uh, other um, hands. Uh, so if no one, has further comments or questions, I think we can come to uh, uh, an end for this session. Uh, thank you very, very much again, Amandine and uh, Lucas. It was a very stimulating and engaging uh, session around your paper, and it has been a pleasure to, to have you. Thank you everyone also for your uh, comments and your participation in the lively discussion. We we'll reconvene in two weeks' time. Uh, we will have a research seminar and a talk by Diane Stone, and hopefully many of you will attend uh, again. Uh, thank you again. Have a good day. Stay safe and see you soon.